as always, for joining us tonight at the Grace Lecture Series. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Brad Wilburn. He is an associate professor in the English and Humanities Department, and uh, the title of his talk is on forgiveness. Uh, Dr. Wilburn is very active in the FYI courses, and one of the courses he is teaching actually is on forgiveness and different aspects of forgiveness. So it's an honor, as always, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brad Wilburn. Thank you, Sean, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, hopefully, we can have a, a good, uh, good discussion here. Um, so basically, what I've got is you know, I'm going to be reading this paper, throwing in a few little extra comments here and there. Um, but uh, I've got basically about uh, 20 to 30 minutes of material here, and so there's plenty of uh, plenty of time. Come on in, have a seat. Where's there? There's still space left. Um, there's, there's going to be plenty of, uh, of uh, wiggle room here for your comments, questions, challenges, so feel free to, uh, uh, to, to uh, chime in as we move along or to save up your, your questions or comments for the end and, and uh, hopefully we can talk about some of these issues. All right. Um, philosophical discussions of forgiveness often take place within a standard uh, action judging framework of permissibility and obligation. Uh, when, when is forgiveness acceptable? Uh, when, if ever, is it required? Uh, when, if ever, is it unacceptably self-abnegating? Uh, these are all important questions, but uh, I'm going to frame my discussion in a different sort of way. Um, I'm going to frame my discussion with an Aristotelian sort of question. So that is, rather than focusing on questions about judging actions, I'm going to think about uh, how we should live our lives and what sorts of character traits and, uh, and um, practices do we need to engage in in order to live good lives. So this was kind of Aristotle's starting point with his ethics is thinking about what constitutes a good life for us humans. And so what I want to think about is not questions about, you know, when might forgiveness be obligatory or required or morally um, expected of us, but uh, what role does it play in helping us live good lives. So in, in answering this question, I will explore some of the connections between forgiveness and moral improvement. So this is kind of the, the, uh, the main focus of my paper, is thinking about some of these connections between this practice of forgiveness and uh, moral improvement. And you know, my, my approach here is that moral concepts, like normative concepts in general, that is, concepts that tell us about how we should behave, how we ought to act, the um, conclusions that are, you know, that we logically ought to reach, these sorts of normative concepts, they're connected with improvement. Um, we talk about what sort of people we ought to be um, and how we ought to, ought to act, at least partly because we are concerned with more nearly approaching those standards. So when we've got normative standards, one of the functions that this plays for us is to help guide improvement. We, are following, we see ourselves as falling short. How can we do a better job of meeting the standards that we're setting out? So the claims that I'm going to defend in this paper are, um, are first of all, that the practice of forgiveness is best seen as part of the practice of reconciliation. Then the second claim I'm going to make is that reconciliation is crucially linked to moral improvement. Okay, so the first question, the first thesis here is a claim, uh, it's a conceptual claim. A claim, I'm going to, you know, make a claim about how we should understand forgiveness. And so this is kind of a long uh, standing topic of discussion. What is forgiveness? What counts as forgiveness? What things are required for forgiveness? And, uh, you know, I'm going to say a, uh, a bit about how I think we should understand this practice of forgiveness. Um, and I'm going to claim that it needs to be embedded within uh, the, uh, this practice of reconciliation, that, that thinking of it in that context is going to help us get a better handle on it. Um, and then the, the, the second claim is a more substantive claim, um, uh, not just a conceptual claim about how to understand the concept, but uh, you know, the, the second claim is a is a claim about um, this is where I'm going to kind of get to the meat of, of my, uh, my concerns here. What is it about this practice? What role does this practice of forgiveness embedded within reconciliation, um, what role does this play in helping us live good lives? Um, so uh, 
um, you know, the, the basic idea here will be that we are beings um, in need of improvement and capable of improvement. And given this, this practice of reconciliation, which, you know, I'm going to argue has um, forgiveness within it, um, uh, the, like the use of moral concepts in general, makes sense for us, given that we are um, beings in need of improvement and capable of improvement. All right, so first of all, the, the, the conceptual part of the paper. We, and so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to draw some connections between the practice of forgiveness and reconciliation. So wrongdoing typically results in estrangement and alienation. The person who has been harmed will withdraw from various forms of interaction with the wrongdoer. Okay, somebody meets, mistreats me, I'm going to stay away from that person. If I've been engaging in interaction with them, I'm going to be less willing to engage in interaction. Or if I have to keep interacting with them, it's not going to be um, in as productive a way. Um, so there's going to be alienation between us. Um, so often, the person who is harmed will, you know, not just withdraw, but they'll have a, a, a desire that the wrongdoer be harmed in return. Sometimes the person being harmed will act on these desires that this other person be harmed and, you know, get retaliation and this sort of thing. So, um, you know, I mean, these are all just kind of basic ways in which wrongdoing diminishes relationships. It gets in the way of productive interaction between us. So, you know, one role that forgiveness can play is to work against this diminishment. Okay, so wrongdoing diminishes our interactions. The basic idea here is that forgiveness helps to recapture the valuable things in our relationship. So we, we rely on our interactions with others to live good lives. When wrongdoing damages those interactions, we can engage in the practice of re reconciliation to repair this damage. Um, the goal is to eliminate or at least to minimize the estrangement, the alienation between the wrongdoer and the victim. And embedded within this practice of reconciliation is forgiveness. So following uh, uh, Joseph Butler uh, in, his, uh, in his sermons, uh, he, one, of, one of his uh, published sermons was on this topic of forgiveness. And he described forgiveness as uh, the forswearing of resentment or other related negative feelings directed towards those who wrong us. So when we're wronged, we have these negative feelings, these feelings of resentment. And forgiveness is typically described as, um, you know, the attempt to distance myself from those negative feelings. Okay, I feel badly towards uh, somebody that has wronged me. If I'm forgiving them, I'm saying I'm going to try not to feel badly towards them. I'm going to try not to resent them. Okay. Um, and so uh, some have included, some have gone farther, further than this and uh, have included the development of positive feelings. Um, some have uh, said, uh, when we think about forgiveness, it's not just forswearing the resentment, but it's also forswearing the negative behavior. Um, you know, and this needs to be, be part of the, the definition of forgiveness. So um, a familiar course that this process of reconciliation takes is as follows. Um, the wrongdoer recognizes his or her mistake and offers an apology. Um, I'm going to come back and say a little bit more about that later. Um, the person who is wronged accepts the apology and offers forgiveness in return, offers, okay, I am going to try not to have these negative feelings towards you. Then the two of them work on repairing their interaction. And so they, they try to engage in this reconciliation where, okay, yeah, I know I've wronged you, but, uh, you know, I'm sorry for that. I'm going to try to do better. Okay, I accept that apology. I forgive you. Let's try to put things back together. Okay, so I take it that this is all, um, all pretty familiar. And, um, I mean, I don't think it's any, you know, great, any big news here that, um, that forgiveness, you know, often gets embedded in this process of reconciliation. Um, and, uh, but I want to be careful here. And, you know, this is where there are, you know, other views on forgiveness that, uh, um, that um, offer some caution about drawing too close a connection between forgiveness and reconciliation. And um, I want to give proper credence to these possibilities. And so I don't want to suggest that, um, 
that being embedded in a process of reconciliation is a necessary condition for forgiveness. Okay? So, first of all, forgiveness is not necessarily triggered by repentance and apology on the part of the wrongdoer. And, you know, this point can be made from a variety of different perspectives. So, for instance, uh, um, you know, those um, operating within the Christian tradition will sometimes insist that uh, we're challenged to offer forgiveness even to those who do not recognize their error. Okay? I mean, this may be somewhat controversial, but it's at least a, a, uh, a possible position that, that uh, the, the, the call to forgiveness goes beyond just forgiving those that have, that have repented of their sins, but, uh, um, you know, offering forgiveness more broadly. Um, further, um, and this is, uh, uh, Sean mentioned the, the FYI course, so these FYI courses, these are these interdisciplinary courses that, uh, that we're offering as first year inquiry courses, and, and uh, so this, here I'm kind of um, trading on some of the, the, the psychological literature here, and so this is a, a topic of study within uh, um, psychology where they're kind of thinking about the role that forgiveness can play in a therapeutic context. Somebody is going in to, to get help with issues that they're facing and, and sometimes forgiveness can play a role in that. And so, so forgiveness has received attention recently from psychologists, some of whom claim that forgiveness in a therapeutic context can have beneficial results for the person harmed even when the wrongdoer doesn't or can't repent. That is, um, you know, and, and um, uh, some of these, um, uh, some of the people working in this field, you know, they, they're working with patients and they tell stories about somebody that, that um, you know, has had horrible things visited upon them as a child and they're bearing the, the weight of this, they're resentful toward the person that, that mistreated them and this is damaging their ability to go on with their lives. And it may be a situation where that person is long dead and cannot apologize, um, but the, the psychologists claim there's still a value to, for this person to, to forgive, to forswear that resentment, to try to unload themselves of that bitterness, um, you know, even though you can't go through this kind of standard process of reconciliation apology, um, forgiveness, and let's reconcile. Um, so there are, there are various reasons why I wouldn't want to necessarily claim that this connection with reconciliation is necessary for forgiveness. Um, and secondly, uh, forgiveness doesn't, um, uh, you know, it doesn't require this, this uh, apology or repentance. Um, and, you know, as, as the, uh, the example of the, the, the person forgiving the, the, the long dead abuser, um, it doesn't necessarily have its eye on repairing the relationship between the two parties. Um, and there, there can be situations in which the, the two parties have been strangers to each other with no prior relationship to repair. Um, uh, you know, it might be argued that forgiveness, you know, we could kind of stretch the concept of reconciliation to say, oh, there's some sense of reconciliation here and that we're at least eliminating any sort of negative interaction launched by the wrongdoing. Uh, but this seems like a, an attenuated sense of, of reconciliation um, if we're thinking of that as kind of going back to an earlier um, state of, uh, of no interaction. That seems like uh, a, a strange sense of, of reconciliation, um, you know. And then we've got these other cases where um, uh, where reconciliation, repairing the relationship, just isn't possible because of death or distance. Um, and uh, um, you know, the there can still be benefit here, um, but it can only be the psychological health of the patient, not the repair of the relationship. Um, and also, you know, in the case of abusive relationships, um, it may be important for the victim not to reconcile. Um, 
even if he or she does forgive. Um, you know, I mean, there can be cases where the victim kind of needs to unburden themselves of the resentment of the feeling of being wronged, even though it would not be healthy at all to try to try to put the relationship back together. Um, and so in, in cases such as these, eliminating the negative feelings can be valuable in and of itself, even if no repaired interaction takes place. Okay, so the basic idea here is I'm what I'm what I'm up to here is I do want to have a connection between uh, forgiveness and this broader project of reconciliation of putting together putting damaged relationships back together. But I want to be cautious here. I don't want to claim too much. I don't want to say that that uh, um, this is kind of definitive of forgiveness. I want to recognize these various ways in which forgiveness can occur outside of this context. Okay, so the connections here between forgiveness and reconciliation aren't strong enough to provide a set of necessary and sufficient conditions that define forgiveness. But, and here's kind of where I want to dig in my heels a bit, on the other hand, these connections, the connections here between forgiveness and reconciliation, are stronger than simply noting that, oh, sometimes forgiveness is in a process of reconciliation, and sometimes it's not. Um, what I want to claim is that, uh, you know, even though this isn't an out, uh, kind of definitive requirement for forgiveness, that it be embedded in a process of reconciliation, um, being embedded in this process of reconciliation is kind of the best case scenario. It's where this practice makes most sense. Um, it's the happiest outcome. You know, there may be various ways in which, in a particular circumstance, um, reconciliation isn't possible or desired. Um, but when we're thinking about forgiveness, um, what we're thinking of is a practice that, at its best, is embedded in a, in a um, process of reconciliation. So forgiveness can certainly go forward without apology and repentance. There can be value for doing this. Um, um, uh, uh, but it, you know, at the very least, it's much more challenging to forgive in such a case where you don't have the other person making, uh, making an apology, making amends, this sort of thing. Um, and in addition, I would argue, there is something incomplete in such a case. Um, you know, if, if um, I've been wronged, I may see the need to get past my resentment, even though this other person isn't admitting their mistake, but there's still something missing there. There's still something missing there. So I can still engage in forgiveness even if the other person hasn't apologized, but I, I still feel the lack of that. Um, so someone who forgives where there has been no repentance typically has at least a hope that the wrongdoer will eventually acknowledge his or her fault, um, a wish that you know, he or she had not done this, done this wrong action. Um, and, you know, sometimes this hope, this hope that the other person will, will eventually see the error of their ways, um, you know, this is, is one of the reasons that might be given for this sort of, of um, supererogatory, this, this uh, uh, you know, um, um, forgiveness even in the case where the other person hasn't hasn't repented is, is the hope that they will repent. And so uh, Timothy Jackson warns against, uh, um, you know, instrumentalizing forgiveness, but he argues that one reason for forgiving um, is, um, as he puts it, to touch the consciences of others, okay, by, by um, you know, taking this, what in some cases may be a pretty extraordinary step of forgiving this, this person, um, sometimes this can, can um, have the effect of, of realizing that hope that you know, I'm not doing this in response to their uh, apology, but in, in hopes that, that this kind of uh, brings this out of them. Um, so uh, Joanna North, uh, uh, one of the, the psychologists that works in this field, uh, um, um, agrees that having received repentance from the wrongdoer um, is not necessary for offering forgiveness. Um, uh, but uh, uh, she does claim that repentance is necessary for accepting forgiveness. 
okay? That is, uh, something is left hanging in the air if that offering is unaccepted. It may still be valuable for me to do that, you know, for somebody that has been harmed to, to, to make the offer um, of forgiveness. But if it's not acknowledged, you know, the other person, oh, I didn't do anything wrong, I don't need your forgiveness, this sort of thing, there's, there's, um, um, there's uh, something missing there. Um, the forgiver may feel no regret about having made the offer, uh, may even feel better off for having offered, but will still feel some degree of, of dissatisfaction. Um, and so the, the picture here is of forgiveness as a gift freely offered for its own sake with no conditions or strings attached. Um, uh, as with any gift, however, it is offered not on the condition of acceptance, but certainly with the hope of acceptance. I mean, that's kind of, you know, we don't want to say it's not forgiveness if you don't have this whole back and forth process going on, but that's certainly kind of the hope um, that that will, will be part of the part of the deal here. So forgiveness that doesn't lead to repaired interaction is also um, more challenging and incomplete than forgiveness that does so lead. Um, Reestablishing positive interaction uh, can help the negative feelings to fade. So remember the uh, um, Butler's uh, definition here of forgiveness as forswearing resentment. I'm committing myself to getting rid of my resentment. Well, that's not just something I say, oh, I think I'll get rid of my resentment. Well, threw that away. I mean, it's the sort of thing that, that you know, as we all know, if we've tried to do this, you know, we have a, a wash of good feelings and, oh, yeah, I've gotten rid of it. And then something triggers the memory of the, of the, the mistreatment and it comes back. And so it's this ongoing process of kind of reshaping my character trait here, my tendency to feel resentment about this, this particular thing. And so, so it's not as if we just do this once and for all, make a decision and ah, the resentment's gone. It's a process here and that process goes forward more effectively if you've got the other person accepting this, making the apology, this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so someone, you know, the example that I gave before, someone who forgives um, a dead or distant wrongdoer will often feel that death or distance as a loss, partly because it forecloses the possibility of repaired interaction. You know, we could never get to the point, you know, where we could get past this. And yeah, I've kind of gotten unburdened myself to some extent of my negative feelings. But, um, you know, I wish I could have made things right with this person. Um, and so, so wrongdoing often does double damage, the, the initial harm and the loss of interaction that that harm generates. Um, now, forgiveness can go forward even with the resumption of interaction is dangerous or impossible, not desired. But, uh, um, but that second, you know, kind of derivative sort of damage still constitutes a genuine loss. Um, you know, good to get rid of the resentment, but, you know, uh, um, you know, there's still something lost there, you know, because of the wrong, the, the, you know, the, the wrong action by the wrongdoer. Um, and, uh, you know, without that process of reconciliation, that's the sort of thing that uh, um, um, uh, is, is kind of long lost. So. Um, uh, forgiveness typically lays the groundwork to recover this loss, even though circumstances prevent that from happening in these sorts of cases. Um, so, um, you know, to conclude this section, my, my conceptual position is as follows. Rather than, than providing a necessary and sufficient set of conditions for defining forgiveness, um, I'm following uh, William Neblett's suggestion that uh, forgiveness is best understood um, as part of our moral practice, you know, that is a pattern of interaction here, rather than as a sharply defined concept. Um, there's a whole host of ways in which we can be forgiving people. Um, you know, the mother who diminishes her resentment towards the serial killer who murdered her son can be described as being forgiving, um, you know, maybe tremendously admirably forgiving, even if she doesn't develop any positive feelings toward the killer or engage in any interaction with him. Uh, the person who resolves to behave with equanimity towards a colleague who betrayed her as being forgiving in some sense, 
even if she still feels a, um, a certain degree of resentment. Um, and so we can, um, uh, you know, we can foster our understanding of these various manifestations of forgiveness, I'm claiming, by considering the happiest case, the best case. And so that's the, you know, the, the connection I'm trying to draw here. In the best case, um, forgiveness is embedded in this practice of reconciliation. Um, an apology, um, a, um, a forgiveness being offered, um, and, and then a process of reconciliation engaged in. Um, um, you know, my suggestion is that this, um, you know, this kind of uh, focusing on this kind of best case scenario, one where the, the wrongdoer apologizes, the victim forgives, and then the two of them work on repairing their relationship. Focusing on this scenario um, helps us get a handle on forgiveness, but I want to be cautious here. Um, it doesn't rule out the possibility and value of forgiveness in other scenarios that don't have all these features. You know, I mean, I think that there's a complicated set of issues here, and uh, we can, you know, kind of still have forgiveness be a valuable process to engage in even if we're not um, you know, able to follow through on all the features of the best case scenario. Um, and you know, finally here, um, for this first section, even if I'm wrong that there is, you know, I'm claiming that there's something conceptually central about this best case scenario, um, it's certainly the case that forgiveness embedded within reconciliation is immensely significant to us. So, um, you know, reconciliation is typically most important to us in just those relationships that are most important to us. Close friendships, family ties, long-term committed relationships. Um, we're most vulnerable in these relationships. Our imperfections can be particularly damaging in this re these relationships. Um, we've all got these imperfections. Um, and you know these are just the relationships that we're le least likely to jettison um, at the first sign of trouble, and so this idea that um, you know within particularly I mean forgiveness applies much more generally, but particularly in these relationships, the ability to repair the damage caused by wrongdoing is crucial, um, and so so you know um, want to try to draw these conceptual connections between forgiveness and this broader process of reconciliation. All right, so there, that's the conceptual part of the, of the paper. And so now what I want to do with that kind of understanding of forgiveness in mind, that it kind of has its best, its happiest home within this process of reconciliation, um, I want to draw some connections between forgiveness and moral improvement forgiveness within this broader process of reconciliation and moral improvement. So considering forgiveness as embedded within recon reconciliation, we can now um, develop connections with moral improvement. So given that, that reconciliation is a response to wrongdoing, um, it's our need for improvement, that is, our tendency to sometimes act wrongly, that sets the stage for reconciliation. So that's kind of an obvious connection. Um, you know, we need to engage in reconciliation because we are sometimes make mistakes. You know, I mistreat my loved ones in various ways, and so um, that you know that by itself indicates okay, there is at least some some need for improvement here, um, and moral improvement uh, plays a crucial role in reconciliation. Um, you know, part of the process here to reconcile is. Um, you know, well, primarily the improvement of the wrongdoer, okay? If I've made a mistake, if I've harmed somebody, um, and we're going to try to repair that, okay, I've got to do some things to figure out, uh, you know, how am I going to avoid doing that again? You know, if, there, if that happened once, there's something in my character that allowed that to happen, um, you know, um, I've got to think about, okay, what do I need to do to, to be a better person so that that sort of damage doesn't happen again? And so, so um, part of the process of reconciliation, I'm going to claim, needs to be this commitment to improvement on the part of the wrongdoer. Um, and uh, um, I'm also going to claim that uh, forgiveness can, in, you know, I'm going to try to be a bit cautious here, um, but forgiveness can also uh, contribute to 
the improvement of the person being wronged. Um, and uh, um, so the, and we'll, I'll come back and say more about that. Uh, um, uh, um, but you know, the basic idea here is if the wrongdoing causes this estrangement, causes this alienation, uh, diminishes the relationship here, um, the, you know, um, uh, and if that estrangement makes sense, you know, it makes sense for me to withdraw from relating with somebody if, if uh, um, you know, I'm getting mistreated, then um, um, attempts to uh, um, um, surmount that estrangement makes sense if that tendency to do wrong in that context is, is being whittled away. If we're kind of trying to say, okay, let's see what we can do to, you know, see what I can do to not be as, uh, as much of a jerk, and, you know. Okay, well then it makes sense to, to uh, uh, resume interaction. All right, so um, let me uh, say a bit more about this. You know, so this is gonna be my, my general claim here that, that if we're thinking about this process of reconciliation, um, uh, uh, it is connected with uh, projects of moral improvement. So reconciliation typically begins with an apology. Okay, so um, you know I've I've described this process of reconciliation as involving the apology, the forgiveness, and then the work to repair the relationship. Um, and uh, um, uh, you know, I claim here that uh, that it, an apology, if it's sincere, um, should involve a commitment uh, to improve on the part of the wrongdoer. Okay, that this is um, you know so I maybe mean, we can. Talk about this. Actually, I've got a footnote here. I want to see where did I get this from? Oh yeah, I footnoted my mom. She told me this a long time ago. Um, <laughs> um, so, so you know, my claim here is well, my mother's claim, and that I'm passing along to you, um, is that this is what it means to make a sincere apology. It is to commit to being a better person. You know, it's not just, uh, so, so, you know, if I apologize for something that I am continuing to do, that is not a sincere apology, you know, if, if yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry for that and I'm going to keep doing that, that is in, insincere. Um, and so, so the, the, the claim here is that apology is not simply backward looking. Um, oh, that's horrible that that happened. Um, if I am repentant, if I'm sincerely repentant, um, you know, I am looking back on my prior actions and judging it negatively. Um, I see this action as something for which I'm responsible. It sprang from my character in a way that generates this responsibility. Um, but, you know, it's not uh, this, this repentance is not just looking back. It is uh, forward looking as well. Um, these evaluations, the, my evaluation that oh, what I did was wrong, um, these evaluations are motivating. And so if I, if I sincerely evaluate this action negatively, I should be motivated to change my character. You know, if this sprang from my character, then I should be motivated to change my character so I don't act in that way again. Um, and it's this commitment to improve that I'm claiming is, is part of a sincere apology um, that serves as the foundation for the attempt to repair the relationship and resume interaction. Okay, so if we're gonna think of this as, you know, part of a process of reconciliation, this commitment to improve kind of has to be there. Um, well, not has to be there. I, in the first part of the paper, I said no, not necessary, but in the best case, this, this is how it all starts off. So, um, you know, even when we forgive in a case in which the offender has not repented, um, you know, my earlier claim that uh, we at least kind of harbor hope that the offender will repent and that our forgiveness might trigger this recognition of error. Um, so to, to forgive um, is then so start, the process starts off with this, uh, you know, this recognition of error and uh, uh, sincere apology I'm claiming is a commitment, you know, not just to judge that my earlier action was wrong, but to commit to making the changes that I need to make to not do that anymore. Um, so now, to forgive in response to a sincere apology is 
uh, partly to join into this project of improvement that has been committed to by the wrongdoer. So by apologizing, I'm claiming, in the best case here, the, the wrongdoer is saying, I'm going to try not to be that sort of person anymore. And by forgiving, part of what the, we do when we forgive is say, OK, I am um, on board with that project. I want to try to help you with that project. And so um, the basic mechanism here, I, I, I would claim, is that the, the forgiver supports the improvement by charitably treating the wrongdoer as improved. Okay? That is, I mean, it's charitable because all the wrongdoer has done so far is kind of committed to this project of improvement. What the person that's forgiving is doing is say, okay, I'm going to try to get rid of those negative feelings. I'm going to try to resume interaction with you um, as if you've been successful. Okay? As if you've made some progress here. And the idea is um, that by kind of being charitable in this regard, this helps support that project that the, that the wrongdoer is engaging in. Um, you know, viewing others charitably can have a self-fulfilling effect. You know, you try to encourage somebody that they can do something and this, you know, you're not sure that they can, but you're being positive and supportive and that helps them um, to have more confidence and helps them succeed. So, so this sort of charitable view um, can have a self-fulfilling effect. Uh, you know, good character rarely occurs in a vacuum. It is supported socially. Um, and by interacting with others charitably, you know, I mean, I may still have some concerns about, oh, is this going to be, you know, the same old thing, but I'm at least going to go into it trying to, um, you know, get rid of my negative feelings, trying to, uh, um, uh, okay, let's, let's um, sometimes uh, it's kind of a fake it till you make it approach, kind of pretend as if you've improved and, um, and then and see and, and hope that that uh, helps contribute to the project. So by by interacting with others charitably in this way, we hold open for them um, a social framework, a pattern of interaction um, that will accommodate their improved self. Okay, okay, you've committed to being a better person. I'm going to try to relate with you in that way so that now there is space for an interaction between um, the better person. Yeah, Joe. Well, and wouldn't you probably, if I'm understanding you correctly, wouldn't, as part of this interaction, you try to reinforce the changes that they claim to have made? Yeah. It's not like you reset completely to how you were before, but if they've made promises to try to improve, you kind of support their improvement efforts. Yeah, you you acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can kind of. Um, um, I'm kind of talking in in broad terms here, but we, we can kind of fill in a lot of the details. You know, in actual cases of interaction, how does this go forward? Where there's a there's a um, you know, if I'm able to, uh, you know, I I do something wrong, and the 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 person that I've wronged is kind of charitably, you know, I've apologized and the person is charitably saying, okay, I'm going to try to interact with you in a certain way, um, you know, and then well, it's tentative at first, but there are ways in which certain things are encouraged and, and um, you know, that, uh, you know, that feeling of, of growth and support is, is real crucial here. So, um, um, and so, you know, we, we encourage that improvement that you know I've claimed the other person when making a sincere apology is committed to, uh, we encourage that improvement by showing them the interaction that the improved self will have access to. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the uh, the the uh, the basic mechanism here and the the you know, um, uh, basic uh, uh, connection here between the. Um, moral improvement and the and this process of, of reconciliation where we're thinking about moral improvement on the part of the the uh, the wrongdoer um, now I made this additional claim though and this one is a little bit more controversial so feel free to, to push back against me at this one uh, with this one but um, I also um, claim that that forgiveness is connected with the moral improvement of the person who is wronged Okay, now I, I need to step carefully here since this sort of talk is, you know, it leads to these worries about forgiveness being overly self-abnegating. 
That is, if I'm, uh, you know, people whose sole thoughts upon being mistreated are about their own faults, um, you know, and oh, you know, I must be so horrible that uh, this person mistreated me like this. Um, uh, you know, the, these um, such people are surely lacking in self-esteem, and so we don't want to go down this road too far. I don't want to put too much weight on this. Oh, forgiveness helps the the, the victim improve as well. Um, so I, I need to stress two preliminary points here um, before I, I make my case. Um, first. Um, the improvement of the wrongdoer is much more central in the process of reconciliation, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the big um, improvement that needs to be engaged in here. Um, and second, the, the claims that I'm going to make here about moral improvement of uh, the, the, the role that forgiveness can play to help the person that's doing the forgiving improve. Um, uh, these, this, this, these sorts of claims always need to be tempered by the recognition that, that um, this can be overdone to the detriment of the victim. Okay? So, so with those caveats in mind, uh, the core idea here, though, is that being wronged does not simply harm the victim in the standard ways. Okay? Somebody, uh, you know, uh, smacks me in the mouth, okay, my mouth hurts, right? Um, uh, the, the, the claim here um, and the role that then forgiveness can play is, uh, is based on the idea that being wronged has the potential not just to harm the victim, but to corrupt the victim. That is, one of the ways in which people become bad is to be treated badly. Um, and so forgiveness is one way to guard against this kind of corrupting potential of being mistreated. And so I'd like to claim that there, there are at least two ways in which it can do this. Um, first of all, forgiveness counteracts our tendency to react to mistreatment in an overly harsh way. I mean, this is, this is uh, Butler's focus in his account of forgiveness. So, I mean, he's a, these were sermons, he's, he's working within the Christian tradition here. Um, and, uh, you know, so he's arguing for the value of forgiveness. Um, and, he, you know, and so he, remember, he's the one that described forgiveness as getting rid of my resentment, for, for, for swearing resentment. Um, and um, he, he, he claims here that, that resentment, you know, feeling bitter, feeling hateful towards somebody that's wronged me, is not intrinsically inappropriate. Okay? That is that that's, you know, kind of a legitimate response to being wronged, is to feel that resentment, to withdraw, to disengage, this sort of thing. Um, but he claims we do have deep-seated tendencies to feel resentment disproportionately, he claims. Um, uh, you know, as a result, any retaliatory action taken is like, likely to be excessive if we're not careful. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, somebody, uh, you know, smacks me across the face and I pull out my submachine gun and shoot down their family, okay? And they say, well, wow, yeah, I slapped them across the face, but that's going too far. Let me pull out my nuclear weapon and, you know, we'll take care of it, you know. And so, so th I mean, this is, you know, obviously human history is, is full of examples of, uh, you know, kind of these cycles of retaliation and escalation. And so, so yeah, resentment can be an appropriate response to being wronged, but it's something we have to be careful about, claimed, claimed Butler. Um, so forgiveness releases us from this trap of bitter resentment, overly bitter resentment, and insatiable desires for revenge. I mean, this is, this is a trap that we can fall into. It's a corrupting trap. Um, it can diminish our lives if we don't let go of things. Um, and so forgiveness kind of helps us avoid this sort of error. Um, secondly, so it, that's one way in which forgiveness can kind of uh, help the person being wronged to improve. Um, secondly, and related to this, being harmed by another can sometimes lead to warped views of that other and oneself. When we're harmed, 
we often demonize the wrongdoer. Now, surely a wrongdoer has faults. I mean, you know, if they did something wrong, um, you know, almost by definition, they have some faults there. But we, as the victims, can tend to exaggerate those faults. And so, um, uh, drawing once again on some of the psychological literature, a, a crucial part of the model of forgiveness that's uh, provided by um, a trio of, of psychologists, Enright, Friedman, and uh, Reek, is what they refer to as reframing. Okay, so what they're thinking about here is, okay, how do we engage in this process of, you know, they're dealing with these patients that are kind of trapped in these cycles of, of resentment and can't let go, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes the harm that they've suffered is, is, you know, horrible stuff. And so there's something where we, you know, say, that, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that resentment is appropriate, but... It's, it's damaging their lives. And so, um, so one of the, the techniques that these psychologists talk about is, is reframing. So, um, you know, and what, what's at work here is the wrongdoer is viewed by the forgiver in, in context in order to develop a more thorough understanding of, of him or her. Um, and, you know, kind of paradoxically enough here, um, sympathizing with the wrongdoer plays a crucial part in this stage of the process of, as these psychologists have worked it out. That is, and this is a, this is a, you know, a big step to take to kind of have been treated wrong by somebody and to try to, try to, try to sympathize with, with that wrongdoer. Um, but the goal here is not to exonerate the wrongdoer, but to understand more accurately how he or she came to act wrongly. And, you know, I mean, I would, I would argue here that in, in the more familiar cases, um, the cases that we have to deal with all the time, with our close relationships, um, we're not dealing, hopefully, with cases where the per people we're interacting with are just hopelessly evil where we would want to hang on to, oh, uh, you know, I've got to make sure that I, I hang on to this idea of this person as just a co completely corrupt individual. Um, you know, hopefully in most of our relationships um, that what we're dealing with is people that aren't horribly evil, but people that are much like us. And so, uh, you know, we do this reframing in these relationships as a, as a matter of course. Um, you know, and we, we, we talk with our loved ones to, you know, try to understand their motivations and to allay our, our darker worries about their views of us. You know, I thought your brusqueness meant that, you, you know, you thought my idea was silly. No, I was rude, and I apologize for that, but it was because I was in a hurry, not because I didn't like your idea, and so, okay, there was some degree of thoughtlessness there, but it wasn't, you know, quite as bad as, as, uh, as one might have thought. And, and note that we have these tendencies to, you know, react, to kind of go to the darker conclusions here when we're being wronged. So part of the process of forgiving um, is to, you know, express those darker worries that get generated by our resentment. Um, and to listen to the explanations offered in return. And then the goal here is to come to an, uh, you know, a more accurate uh, shared understanding of how the wrongdoing happened. Um, also, when we're harmed, you know, in addition to you know, kind of having a tendency to sometimes view the, the wrongdoer as over, you know, in an overly negative way. Certainly there's some degree of, of fault there, but, uh, you know, we have a tendency to exaggerate. Um, you know, it's also the case that when we're harmed, we sometimes overlook our own faults. Um, resentment is a breeding ground for hypocrisy. When we're, when we're hurt, we lash out against the faults of others deflecting attention from our own susceptibility to error. Sometimes it's the most convenient thing in the world to be mistreated because then you get to go into high dudgeon and uh, righteous anger and this sort of thing and, and oh good, I don't have to worry about my own faults. And so, so reminding ourselves of our own faults is one way to reduce our resentment of others. You know, uh, somebody's been thoughtless to me and I'm all, you know, in a high 
date of resentment here. And then I remember, oh yeah, I kind of treated this other person in a similar way a week before, you know, and I kind of forgave myself for that, you know, pretty quickly. Um, you know, oh, this is just a, you know, moment here. So maybe I should forgive this other person as well. So um, uh, reflecting on the way um, in which uh, uh, someone's someone else has um, um, someone else's faults have harmed us um, can can provide an impetus for us to work against our own faults um, and you know their power to to cause similar harm to others so uh, by working to avoid these these you know these warped views not completely misguided but but you know prone to exaggeration sorts of views that being harmed sometimes engenders um, we fo we we foster a more realistic picture of how human error is located in human lives um, now to be sure we're sometimes confronted by inexplicable evil you know I mean I think Movies love this, you know, you get a real big villain, okay, that makes for good theater. Um, but much more often, we have to deal with people who are facing familiar temptations, everyday foibles, um, and so by striving to see ourselves and others as sharing this territory between, you know, perfection and inex inexplicable evil, uh, by trying to see what's understandable about their mistakes, and by being honest about our own susceptible, susceptibility to similar errors, we are better equipped to engage in this common project, and I think that it really is a, a kind of communal project here in various ways of making ourselves better. Um, so, in conclusion here, uh, this discussion of forgiveness and moral improvement illustrate, il illustrates a general point about moral improvement and fulfilling relating. Um, Moral improvement is a process that goes forward for others and also with others. These two things are mutually supporting. We engage in our relationships um, partly to help us engage in moral improvement. You know, this isn't surprising. We're social creatures. We do everything as, you know, in community with others. It's not surprising that we work on shaping our character in community with others. Um, and then the connection goes in the other direction as well, so we engage in our relationships to help foster uh, moral improvement, and we engage in moral improvement to help our relationships be more fulfilling. I mean, this is, uh, you know, to kind of go back to this original question about, uh, you know, the, the good life. Um, a crucial component of the good life is fulfilling relationships with others. And so, um, to the extent that both of these things, becoming better people, having fulfilling relationships with others, um, are important to our lives going well, we have an answer to the question of how forgiveness helps us to live good lives. It does so by helping us to improve ourselves and others, and by contributing to our ability to engage in fulfilling relationships with others. Thank you very much. So, uh, any questions, comments, challenges? Is, is the feeling of forgiveness a virtue in itself, or is it possible, and without going into the self-abnegation right, right. you went into, because I don't think that's necessarily right. the case, um, is it ever inappropriate? From Aristotle's perspective, I mean, it's all about the appropriate amount and the appropriate time and the appropriate place. So, is it ever inappropriate to forgive? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it's uh, uh, it's not a question that Aristotle wrestles with, and so I mean, which is kind of interesting in and of itself that this isn't a, a you know a, a, a huge deal for him. Um, but uh, I mean, we can we can we can think about that. Um, and uh, now you bracketed the case where uh, that I would naturally go to, which is the case of 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 self abnegation, um, uh, where you know if if it's just kind of too quick, mm -hmm. uh, you know I don't know that I would want to call that wrong, find fault with that, but I would, I guess it would it would cause me to worry. Isn't that but, what Ailey Wiesel 
is struggling with? Uh, is yep. it appropriate to forgive the Nazis? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. forgive the unforgivable. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so, so I, mean, uh, I mean, one of the things to note is that, that those are cases where we're dealing with extreme wrongdoing, um, you know, huge moral errors, and there the, you know, the framework that I'm kind of portraying here as kind of the best possible case may not be in play as much anymore um, in those. Nelson but you Mandela. And, um, yeah. The, the almost absolute, uh, absolute forgiveness of uh, what happened. To yep, Martin. yep. And so, so um, I mean, this is maybe getting back to those, those issues that I set aside at the beginning, um, which, you know, are worth thinking about. Um, and so, um, I mean, I guess my tendency would, I would hesitate to point to a particular case of somebody forswearing resentment and saying, oh, they shouldn't have done that. Um, but I would certainly hesitate to find fault with somebody that didn't, didn't in some of these circumstances. And so, um, you know, exactly how to parse all that, you know, is I think worth, worth thinking it's, about. It's yeah. always good to forgive, but sometimes it's, it's good to avoid certain people. Yeah. You, know? you don't yeah. have to punish yourself. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and you should always, you know, seek justice, too. I'd, I'd like that go a step further and say it's not always good to forgive. And what sort of case do you have in mind there? In the wider cases of abuse, like we're talking about, um, uh, perhaps when you're dealing with a narcissistic personality and you're uh, attempts to empathize do exactly the wrong right. thing, you know. So I, I, I am just trying to find, you know, those outliers yep. because yep. I think it's, it becomes a truism that it's always good to forgive. That's the Christian perspective. That's not Aristotle's necessarily. Uh, right. I don't think it would it would uh, um, it would necessarily be be Aristotle's. Um, though, like I say, he doesn't. Um, you know, do yeah, I mean, that the, the doesn't really um, uh, think a whole lot about he getting rid of. DSM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there's there's some stuff that comes up in his discussion of of justice, but you know, there's going to be a you know part of justice is, is and there's nothing about forgiveness that rules out punishment. Um, you know, it, it's and so so I mean even. So if we if we kind of deal with this sort of case, so dealing with a narcissistic person, where if I'm forgiving, that may fuel their narcissism. Um, note that that may be a case where I should distance myself from the interaction, shouldn't engage in the reconciliation, but it might still be valuable to rid myself, valuable for me at least, to rid myself of the resentment. You stand up but, for yourself, but not. You know, if you resent willing to entertain that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know, yeah. I know Dean. that your paper doesn't didn't have time to deal with this, but I'm troubled by some of your 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 absolute concepts here, uh, such as wrongdoing and the wronged person. It's almost as if there's a causal relationship here between uh, being wronged, whatever that would be, and I have a right to feel resentment, and therefore to forgive to, is, some, is to give up something that belongs to me that I have a right to, so it's kind of a sacrifice. And I'm thinking more in lines of like uh, Aurelius and the Stoics, that sometimes being wronged isn't the action, but rather the judgment of the person who feels that they are wronged. Right. And that is what needs to be let go, um, perhaps. And yeah. Does your, does your does Aristotle well, deal with that? I mean, I, I think that that um, that uh, this um, that the that the Stoic example there is uh, you know very much in line with you know uh, seeing forgiveness as a form of moral improvement. But there's nothing that is, to forgive often. Uh, well, if we're thinking of forgiveness as getting rid of the resentment, I mean, what the Stoic is going to say is that me being harmed is a result of my thinking. mistaken thinking, okay. and so I need to repair that within myself. Okay. Now, this is a part so of Stoicism. Of this, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is a part of Stoicism that's, that's actually very controversial, yeah. that some people worry that it's, it's too... 
um, and you know I was trying to be cautious here about not wanting to go too far down that road. Um, but uh, but you know that sort of worry that oh every time I'm getting wronged I'm thinking of this anytime I am harmed. So the Stoic view here is that it's not what the other person does to me that is causing the harm. It is the belief that it is harmful that is causing the harm, because once we understand what truly harms me, other people can't do that. Other people can hurt my body, but that's not genuine harm according to the Stoic, you know? Um, <laughs> you know? And so, so, so then if, if that's our model, then any time I am suffering as the result of somebody else, it's because I have handed power to them um, over my own psyche. Um, they have a control well, over their self, but you have your own. And I just meant that in our sometimes in our just our day to day actions with people, oftentimes it's it's you feel harmed when there really isn't harm any harm, and then you feel like, oh, I'm going to ask you, I, I I want you to apologize so that I may forgive you. Yeah, just, uh, oh, that that that, that can certainly be a, be abusive. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, uh, um, you know, if somebody comes up, you know, if I, yeah, if I, if I, if I forgive you for that question, you know, then you're going to say, wait a minute, forgive me? It was a good question. Yeah. And so that would be, that would be extremely patronizing, you know, for somebody to, to kind of engage in this. But you've improved. Right, right, right. So, so, um, you know, note that, that in order to distinguish these cases, we would need an answer to the question about whether genuine harm was done. And so you started off by saying, oh, you're worried about the absolutes, but it sounds like you kind of need some sort of... Well, no, I think in a longer paper you would probably define what you mean by wrongdoing and, and harm. And uh, I think even in a longer paper I'd bracket it, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Is the Other, of yeah. a precondition for forgiveness? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it, it egolessness. Um, I mean, certainly that would be one way to forgive. I mean, I think this sense of being harmed is definitely has the ego in it. And so if I get rid of that sense of, you know, um, me and my projects or diminish it, then the sense of me being harmed floats away as well. Um, but I think that it's possible to still be pretty bound with the self. Um, and, you know, be locked into my own projects and things like this and still release the resentment. Um, but, I mean, I think that that's, um, that's one way it might go is to, to, and, you know, it's kind of um, maybe a bit in a, well, the Stoics weren't really egoless, but, uh, but they were, it was a different sense of the self, you know, kind of, um, you know, and, and certainly this, this kind of shares that with them of kind of reconceiving this, you know, thinking about well, why am I all, um, you know, locked into the fact that this person insulted me? All that was was just air coming out of their mouth in a weird pattern. <laughs> you know, what's, you know, and, and so you know, what does that have to do? And Yeah. Good. Any other? Comments, questions? Thank you. Yeah, Vera? Again. Well, well, Vera, I, I, I wanted to get at least one student uh, uh, question. How so. would you compare or contrast forgiveness and self-forgiveness? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a good question. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, my, uh, so this is maybe just self-reporting, and so you, you all can correct me if, if you kind of feel things differently, but, but um, I think that there's actually a slightly different emotion involved uh, toward the wrongdoing of others and the wrongdoing that we engage in, the things, you know, that, uh, you know, I've done this thing that I need to forgive myself for. That is, it's not quite resentment that I feel toward myself. More shame. Yeah, guilt and shame and, and, you know, sadness and disappointment in myself and that sort of thing. And so, I mean, I think there's definitely overlap here. And, and, and you know, I mean, we use the same concept, we use the same term. And so um, I think that there are negative feelings there um, that, um, that are based on the wrongdoing. Um, I th 
I don't, I don't know, my, my take is that the negative feelings are slightly different when it's my own wrongdoing that I'm having negative feelings to towards versus the wrongdoing of but somebody can you else. Do you wrongdoing to yourself that you need to forgive yourself for? Uh, no, I mean, I think that or the sort of, other. yeah, I mean, I think that, that it can happen in a case where, where, you know, I've done something bad to somebody else and, you know, I just now have this, and you know, it's this. It, it has a bit of overlap with the sort of tendency I talked about here to maybe exaggerate the, to demonize the wrongdoer. And I think that can sometimes happen in our own case where I, you know, I might have made a mistake, but it wasn't, you know, a horrible thing. And then if I kind of have this view of myself as this horrible person, that can kind of become a self-fulfilling prophecy too. And so I need to kind of back away from that overly harsh view. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of potential overlap there. Um, like I say, my take on it is that there's a bit of a difference in the negative feeling I have toward my own wrongdoing as opposed to the wrong. But I don't know, does that strike you as right? Does, you know, it's... Yeah, I think so. I think they're sort of related and sort of not. I mean, yeah. Things that hurt like other people or things that other people do to us that hurt us, could be different than what we did that hurt us. Like the source of forgiveness to the other person and forgiveness to yourself kind of like different. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they're kind of yeah, they're kind of overlap because there's some similar things. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's it's a it's just a a very rich set of practices actually. And you know, I kinda wanna locate the discussion here within the the practices, the way in which we go about doing these things, and and uh, um, and you know, I mean, I think that that I mean, all these things, apology and and forgiveness. I mean, it. Um, you know, I kind of described the best case, but there's lots of kind of halfway there sorts of cases that that are that are, you know, are kind of good enough to help us get the work done of, you know, I mean, you'll have, and this maybe picks up on, on, uh, on, on Dean's comment here about, you know, kind of differing views of the wrongdoing. Um, you know, there'll be a case where, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody harms me and uh, they don't think that they've done something all that bad. And, They'll be saying, yeah, I'm sorry, and they're thinking, muttering beneath their breath, yeah, I'm sorry that you got so upset over just a little harmless comment, um, you know, and, and uh, but, you know, as long as they don't, as long as it's under their breath and not to me, if they say, yeah, I'm sorry, and they're thinking, I'm sorry, you're so sensitive, and I'm thinking, okay, well, they'll be a little more careful next time. Sometimes that's good enough to get things back on track and that sort of thing. Even though there's, you know, I kind of describe part of the process as coming to this shared understanding of the, um, of the wrongdoing. I don't think that's completely necessary. I think you can, you know, get some progress if as long as, okay, well, I'll be a little more, a uh, little more careful in interacting with overly sensitive Dr. Wilburn and, and say, oh, okay, well, he's, he's recognized what a mistake he made and he's not going to do that again. And okay, we can, we can kind of repair things there. So there's, there's the, the, the practices here, a lot of different possible cross currents. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, one thing that I noticed before we conclude, uh, the students that are here, I do have a little um, Stampy type thing if you have your cultural bingo cards. Um, oh. And I would be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> you sat through the whole talk and it didn't even bring the card. Actually, come, come, to, come to the dean's office so that you can give the real stamp so that you might win a prize. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, also, there is cookies and coffee left. And thank you so much, Dr. Mifford. That was very good.